All right, so we're talking about today some special populations. We're going to talk about pediatrics and geriatrics. We're going to start with the geries first. So when I say geriatrics, who am I referring to? The older people. What does older people mean? Don't say 32, because I'll be very sad. Please don't say that. Uh, what's a difficult age for like elderly? Do you 65. 65 is a pretty good one. Good age. Uh, so we're kind of consider them geriatrics. Um, you know, we're finding that as a population, we're getting older and older. So you're going to be dealing with a huge majority of your patients being elderly. Um, why is this important from a drug standpoint? Do you think? Yeah. So again, we're going to look at differences in kinetics. They're also going to be on an increased number of drugs. They're going to have all kinds of issues. And uh, I'll never forget when I was in, in pharmacy school, we did these uh, these brown bag uh, events. Anyone ever heard of a brown bag event? Basically, you go out to a nursing home, and they have all the residents come out with their brown bags full of all their medications, and they have like 40 pill bottles. Some of them are from the 80s. Uh, half of them have been discontinued. The other half are expired, and you're just trying to go through and be like, okay, what are you actually on? What are you supposed to be taking? Here's the actual pill bottles. Because, again, you know, geriatrics, they like to hoard stuff in a lot of cases. A lot of them um, have very fixed incomes. They don't like to throw away things. So, again, they keep all these bottles around that for medications they should not be taking or haven't been taking for years because it's... This is what they do. Um, so you'll, uh, we're going to go over some of the issues that uh, come about from these elderly patients. We're also going to look at some uh, specific questions you want to ask when trying to get a good history from them from a drug sort of standpoint. So um, looking at kind of a comprehensive assessment, we're going to focus. Here's just one example. There, there's many of them that are out there. But the concepts you're going to focus on when trying to get good information from a geriatric patient is going to be pretty ubiquitous amongst all of these. Um, but we know we're, we're focusing on several different kind of problems that develop with elderly patients, uh, specifically, you know, functional issues, right? When I say functional issues in terms of drugs, what does that mean? Sure. Um, well, can they even take the medications, right? So imagine you have uh, a stroke patient who has, uh, you know, dysarthria and dysphagia. Like, are they going to be able to swallow tablets? Potentially no, right? Um, you know, imagine a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis and you prescribe them a medication they have to inject into themselves with like a, a, a pen injector, but their, their joints are so uh, disfigured at this point due to their disease that they can't actually inject anymore. Right? These are things you have to consider from a functional sort of standpoint. Can they actually take the medication? Um, obviously, medically, they're going to be getting more complex as they get older. We're going to look at those declines in function a little bit later. Um, psychosocial issues. So for instance, you know, do they have, how can they pay for things? Uh, what is their nutrition like? Do they have someone to take care of them? You know, what's their mental decline like? And they even remember to take medications. You know, these are things we're going to focus on. And again, frequently we should be taking advantage of the interdisciplinary team of providers, right? So not just looking at you guys as kind of like the central core of the team, but also looking at nursing, looking at nutrition, looking at the pharmacy side, looking at every PTOT. That's a huge thing that uh, a lot of people don't necessarily consider. You got to include everyone in, in, the, um, in the talk there because everyone having their own unique perspective gets a much better, clear picture on the patient, what, what's going on with them. So looking at things like uh, activities of daily living, like, you know, what are the basics that they are able to take care of? Can they go to the bathroom on their own? Can they bathe themselves? Can they do any of these kind of normal maintenance things? And if not, you know, what kind of help do they have in, in, in doing that, right? Um, obviously, we'd like them to be able to do some of these more intermediate to advanced things, but a lot of patients may not be able to depending on age, uh, diseases, et cetera, right? Um, but, you know, looking at things like can they prepare meals for themselves? Um, can they uh, do their own laundry? Can they remember to take their medications? They have access to their own medications and things like that you want to be asked about. Um, so some of the things I want to focus on things like the nutrition uh, of the patient, right? So for instance, imagine um, if you have poor nutrition, we know that affects many things. Like uh, if you are not able to take in good amounts of protein, what do you think happens to your serum proteins like albumin? probably decrease, right? So again, you have patients who are chronically malnourished and may not have all those nice proteins to bind up your drugs. Again, we know that changes things like volume distribution, right? Based on, on your test, right? Um, so lots of things like that can be can be factors here. Um, you know, they may have decreased appetite. Is it due to the fact that they are unable to eat? Maybe due to, like, say, poor fitting dentures? Are they uh, maybe lonely or depressed? Or potentially they're on things like appetite suppressing drugs. All these are things that can be affecting. And again, each of them may have a different um, uh, way to, to manage it, right? Um, you know, things like financial resources, um, you know, they have access to programs like Meals on Wheels and, you know, things like that. Um, but in a lot of patients, they may have limited access to actually uh, have actually have the food or make it themselves, as the case may be. 
Um, you typically want to ask them, uh, you know, pretty detailed recall, say like the last 24 hours. So for instance, you know, what kind of foods are they uh, ingesting? What kind of drinks are they having? Vitamins, supplements. Um, this can come up in a number of different ways. So for instance, you know, if you're treating them for say a bacterial infection, they are giving them a drug like ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin, so cipro or leviquin. Um, and that you ask them, okay, what kind of, what kind of, um, you know, drinks are you intaking throughout the day? They say, oh, I drink milk every morning and every night, right? Well, We'll know, we'll learn about this in, in Farm 1, but that actually is a, a very potent uh, cat, uh, chelator that will bind up that fluoroquinolone and prevent it from ever being absorbed. So, okay, well, you're taking your drugs like you're supposed to, but we're not clearing the infection, what's going on here? It could be related to things like a drug-food interaction that can uh, pop up there, right? Um, vitamins and supplements, you know, ask them about things they can get without a prescription, things that they're taking, um, because... I've had uh, one patient actually came in to the ER. She was um, an elderly patient. She was on warfarin for AFib, and then she decided she wanted to, to take something for her memory. Like she knew her memory was going. Anyone know like any supplements can help with that? Uh, ginkgo is the one she ended up taking. Ginkgo actually has some decent anticoagulant effects of its own. So this lady came in with stroke symptoms. We did a CT, and guess what? Huge, massive head bleed, right? And it was something that even though you think ginkgo, you think dietary supplements, oh, they're, they're pretty safe in the wrong hands or in the wrong patient that could be potentially deadly, right? And that patient unfortunately uh, succumbed to that. So these are things you want to take into account. Um, you know, other things like grapefruit juice, we mentioned that can be a potent CYP3-4 inhibitor that can have effects on drug levels. You know, these are all things you want to be asking about. Um, you know, uh, one of the big things I ran into, and, and I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys, but one of my first rotations in school was at a warfarin clinic. Basically, we were handling patients and their, their Coumadin levels and, and uh, looking at their INRs, and it was in Palaka, Florida. I don't know if I mentioned them from around Palaka. Anyone familiar with Palaka, Florida? Yeah, not, not many, but um, it's a very kind of rural sort of community. Uh, actually, I'm not even from Palak. I'm from like outside of Palak. Is it, is it that much worse? But a lot of these patients, are, they grow their own their own vegetables. They, they eat a lot of collard greens and kale and spinach, and that has a huge effect on vitamin K intake, and which can affect warfarin pretty significantly. So the question was, okay, well, what kind of vitamin K intake do you have by trying to get down to, well, what leafy green vegetables are you eating? How much are you eating every day? Is it consistent? Is it erratic? You know, those are things you have to find out. So diet can be huge in affecting um, uh, multiple factors here of different drugs specifically or just kind of health overall. Uh, other things, uh, ask about alcohol. You know, how much, uh, how many uh, drinks of beer, liquor, wine are they getting in a day? Um, you know, when you say things like, you know, how, how many beers do you drink in a day? And they're like, oh, I only drink two beers. What's well, another question you can ask? How big are those beers? Like, you know, is it, uh, is it just a you know, normal sized can? Is it one of these tall boys? That can make a difference. Uh, are you drinking normal Bud Light, which is maybe like, you know, four and a half percent? Or are you drinking like the really like artisanal craft brews or like nine percent? Like you can get some pretty heavy. Beer. That's a big difference, right? Um, you know, what kind of liquor are they intaking? Usually a uh, patient may not want to be real forthright. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, but other things, you ask about money. Do they have the ability to buy food? Um, other things like over-the-counter medications, um, weight loss is, is a big thing. Weight loss or weight gain, depending on on the situation, you know, especially patients who have like more edematous sort of conditions, we will track weight daily, see if they're holding on to fluid. But if they're not getting good nutrition, you may see they will be losing weight over time. That can be something to, uh, something to look at. Uh, looking at laboratory tests, this is very important to make sure we have good laboratory uh, monitoring for our patients. You don't want to do it too frequently because that can be expensive and may not be all that useful, but you have to, you have to do it at some point, right? Um, I can't tell you how many patients we'd have coming in from the nursing homes where they would be started on a medication decades ago. Uh, no one ever double checked their renal function going forward. And now their levels are sky high and they're developing seizures from say theophylline overdose, right? That was not their fault. It was just the fact that no one actually reassessed their renal function. So you want to have a baseline. You want to wear, know where they're starting and recheck it periodically to see how things are trending, right? Because typically does organ function improve as someone gets older? No, we're going to find it actually gets worse uh, for most organs as, as time goes on. So you want to do things like, you know, monitor things like their complete metabolic panel. You guys have any lab, uh, lab courses about laboratory tests or anything? Here's some basic ones you'll run into. Uh, so a CMP is a complete metabolic panel. This will typically include things found in the basic metabolic panel, which has basic electrolytes and glucose and, and renal function. But we're going to look at things like kidney function, liver function, electrolytes like potassium, sodium, chloride. Uh, glucose can be really important here, albumin, and then things about acid-base balance, right? So what's their bicarb level? Typically, patients, as they get older, tend to have a worse time kind of maintaining acid-base balance, as you'll see. Um, and so that can be important to look at. Um, you know, things like liver function, looking at, you know, total protein levels, albumin, uh, ALT, ASD, these can give us an idea of how well that liver is functioning for that patient. You know, they may have some chronic issues that develop like cirrhosis or uh, hepatitis, things like that. Um, cholesterol can be really important for looking at things, especially like cardiovascular risk as time goes on. If you're treating, you know, hyperlipidemia, you want to be able to monitor for that. Uh, anyone know what A1C checks for? 
Yeah, it's like blood sugar basically over a, a three month sort of period, kind of average blood sugar there. Uh, that's important for what type of patients? Diabetics, Diabetics absolutely good. Um, CBC can be useful. You know, a sign of poor nutrition may be manifested as things like, you know, uh, anemia. So that can be one thing you're looking at with the CBC. Um, B12 levels, why do we care about B12 levels? Yeah, it can also lead to anemias, right? So, you know, if they can't absorb enough of that. Um, your analysis can be useful as well. So, again, if they're spilling a lot of protein or spilling sugars and things like that, that can give you a sign that kidney function may not be going great. Um, you know, what's the other big way we, we monitor for kidney function? Serum. Serum, serum creatinine, right? And urine output can also be another thing as well. Good. Um, so, the problem with this, though, is or with a lot of elderly patients, they experience what we call polypharmacy. Oh, yes, sir. Last, um, slide. Sure. What, um, um, just get an idea for kind of what we're, I'm not going to ask you specifically what tests you're going to order for, for these patients. That's going to be more important when we get into talking about individual drugs. This is more just kind of a global sort of like con conceptual sort of thing, right? So again, you know, it's important to make sure you're monitoring things like, you know, organ function for elderly patients. Like I think it's probably a no-brainer, but it's, it's at least bears repeating right here saying that, hey, you got to monitor for these things. So if you only check it once 10 years ago, and you assume the patient's organ function doesn't change at all, you're, you're going to be wrong, right? You're going to find that, that that liver function has gone down, kidney function has gone down, and you have to recheck for that sort of thing, right? Because, you know, a lot of these patients, they may not have a lot of contact with healthcare providers. They may not have a lot of routine checkups, and so they can go years without having any kind of checks done, and those levels can be totally, totally out of whack, you know, either too low or too high or whatever, and anything in between, right? Um, so, anyway, so with polypharmacy, basically this means um, the use of five or more regular medications for these patients. How often do you think this occurs? all the time right so again that's because we have things like longer life expectancy these patients are living longer which means they're developing more diseases they have to treat um, the number of chronic diseases is going up for these patients and also uh, just due to the fact we have evidence-based guidelines right so again depending on the suite of diseases your patient has it's not uncommon for them to be on a dozen different medications so for instance and this is again all following the guidelines because again good medical practice good evidence-based care is to follow the guidelines right they, they've done all the research for you they put it all together and made the recommendations you should probably follow those for most patients you know, so if you have someone who has CHF, who has a uh, previous, you know, MI, you know, they could be on an ACE inhibitor, they could be on a, a statin, they could be on uh, a beta blocker and a diuretic. And, you know, so you can see how the list of medication, that's only for like two disease states, right? Uh, which another um, but basically what you're going to find is that as age... Um, as they get older, you're going to find more comorbidities. You're going to be finding that with each additional disease, there can be an 8% increase in the number of drugs they're taking. So if someone who has osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, COPD, you know, 12 different medications five times a day, right? You know, almost kind of, if you guys ever look at like documentaries of like HIV back and it's like early treatment, they used to take so many pills. I mean, this is the, kind of the same thing they're doing here, right? So again, um, this is why you can have a really big role in playing like, okay, well, how can we cut down the number of medications they're on? Or how can we combine some of these together or maybe make it so they're taking it less frequently, right? Because again, um, you know, how compliant are patients going to be with this sort of regimen? hit or miss, right? You know, and again, I can barely take a multivitamin every single day. And imagine these older patients who have mental decline, uh, who have issues with finances and things like that, they're going to have a really hard time being being compliant with this, right? They're going to do their best probably, but they may not be able to, to kind of keep up with it. And then uh, hospitalizations are a big thing. So again, um, generally when you leave the hospital, you have more medications you're on than when you came in in a lot of cases, right? Over half of those, uh, those stays are going to develop with more prescriptions, right? Some of them may be lifelong, some of them may be short course, but again, something to note. So again, the consequences of this, you're gonna have more adverse drug reactions, right? And very frequently patients will come in with a complaint. You may not even realize it's a side effect of one medication that how do you fix it? You prescribe another medication, right? And you get this kind of sick cycle where they're gonna be on more and more meds. And again, that may be job you know, security for me. However, it's not great for our patients, right? So again, my mantra is generally fewer meds, the better for your patients if you can get away with it, right? Um, elderly patients typically are more likely to have falls, especially if they have uh, things like orthostatic hypotension. Um, you know, if you're giving them meds that are causing hypotension, sedation, lightheadedness, anything like that, um, that can lead to falls. And what, what, why are falls a problem in elderly patients? Fractures, fractures right? So again, if they get a hip fracture, uh, femur fracture, anything like that, that can be debilitating for the rest of their lives, right? So again, huge mortality and morbidity associated with fractures, don't like that. And then decreased compliance as well, right? The more complicated it is, more meds, less compliant they're going to be. 
So um, the reasons why they may be having decreased compliance, obviously due to things like complex dosing schedules, uh, multiple medications, uh, the economics of it can be a big deal. So, you know, if your patients can't afford the medication, they can want to take it all day long, but if they can't afford it, they're not going to, they're not going to get it right. Um, they either may just not get it at all, or they may do things like skip doses. So they say, well, they told me to take it three times a day, but I, I can afford it. If I only take it twice a day, I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Right. And then when, the, when they come back in, they say, Hey, are you taking this three times a day? What do they tell you? Absolutely. Yes, of course I am. Right. Because, you know, I mean, they may not want to lie to you or but, you know, they don't want to um, have that negative judgment from from their providers. Right. So they're going to they're gonna tell you what you want to hear. In a lot of cases, not everyone. But, you know, in general, you're going to find that uh, they, they they want you to, to, to think that they're actually following the regimen you prescribe for them. Um, you know, look at things like, you know, lack of support. So they don't have someone around to actually make sure they're taking their medications, whether it be a loved one or uh, some sort of other healthcare provider coming to their home. Um, mental decline, obviously, is a huge thing. They can't remember uh, when they're supposed to take their medications, if they took their medications. Uh, have it, uh, tons and tons of calls to the poison centers. They're like, hey, I took my medication twice. I forgot that I already taken it this morning. And then two hours later, I ended up taking another dose, right? That is a very common occurrence we see with that. Um, decreased swallowing ability, uh, more advanced Parkinson's, stroke patients, they can have pretty significant effects where you have to make sure if they can't take pills, then maybe you have to convert it back over to things like liquids, right? Um, so those are things to consider. Uh, a lot of these patients will have decreased venous access, especially if they are frequent visitors to the hospital system because they are getting constant sticks. You're going to find they can become much more difficult to get good uh, access on, especially if they develop more kind of uh, scar tissue over the normal sites. Um, and then just patient willingness to adhere to treatment. You know, when do you think they get to a point where they just don't want to do treatment anymore? Probably end of life, right? You know, so again, there's this concept of qual um, quality of life versus quantity of life. You know, are we trying to extend our lives longer? Or are we just trying to make their lives more comfortable for the time they have left here, right? So um, again, we consider end of life to be patients who are roughly around six months uh, left to live. However, that can be variable depending, again, we get that wrong all the time when trying to estimate how long someone has left to live. Um, but you really need to try to prioritize treatment. So, um, you know, I'm the toxicologist. I like to keep people alive when they take too many medications. My wife did her specialty training in, in uh, hospice care and, and pain management. So she likes to make sure they're as comfortable as possible. You know, she gives them all the opioids to make them nice and sleepy. And I'm like, no, give them Narcan. She's like, don't do that. Anywho, right, so again, early on, you're looking at, you know, life extension. We're trying to make sure the patients are sticking around as long as possible. But at a point, you're going to get to that, that hospice level of care, that, that palliative treatment where you say, okay, let's just make you comfortable, right? Um, we'll have these patients who are uh, in-stage COPD patients, and they get so oxygen hungry, they just cannot oxygenate very well. Uh, they're just in an in incredible uh, discomfort, you know? And so what we'll actually do is give them opioids to try to blunt that response. They have so much CO2 they build up in their system. We'll kind of let you give them some opioids. We know that's going to have negative effects on their respirations, but just to blunt that, so they're just more comfortable, right? So that way when they go out, they at least don't have to go out, you know, gasping for air, right? So that's one of those things where trying to improve their quality of life can be much more important than quantity of life in, in certain instances, right? So anyway, again, this is when they get to the point where they say, okay, well, you know, what do you actually want done? You know, do you want us to go through these heroic efforts? Do you want CPR? Do you want IVs? Do you want antibiotics? These are good things for people to figure out before they get to that point. Uh, so especially as, you know, parents get older and things like that, they have to start to think about these sort of things. So like my parents are starting to go through that right now. They're like, okay, well, we don't have a ton of chronic conditions, but do we want to have all these things done? Do we want to be have DNRs and all these? Or, uh, anyone know what a DNR is? Yeah, do not resuscitate. So these are all things you have to kind of consider going forward. You never want to be in that case where like someone's actively coding. You're like, wait a second, do we do CPR? Do we not do C? That's a really awkward position to find yourself in. I will, I will tell you. Um, yeah, you don't want to be in that position. Anyway, so let's look at some normal changes we see in our geriatric patients. As far as cardiac goes, typically you're going to find they become more hypertensive as time goes on um, due to that increase in afterload. You guys covered like afterload and preload. That'll be something we'll talk about at least uh, for my class when we get to the cardiac section. But basically, um, imagine you're trying to, um, you have a garden hose, you're, you're putting pressure on one end of it, right? So again, that's considered the afterload, how much uh, uh, pressure your heart is having to pump against. The heart gets tired over time, right? You're going to find that it, it can, it'll hypertrophy just like any muscle as you work it out, but it's going to get um, less compliant. You're going to find it gets less flexible. It's going to be uh, having a decreased function over time. That's where you can develop things like CHF and, and left ventricular dysfunction. But basically, you find that that will uh, develop, their heart is going to become less efficient over time. Uh, reduced heart rate can occur along with this. Um, so again, cardiac function is going to go down. Okay, so we know they're going to be perfusing less efficiently than they used to. Um, from a renal standpoint, they're going to become uh, have decreased renal mass. They're going to have their their uh, reduced flow to the afferent artery. Right, when we talk about the the uh, glomerulus and talking about flow into the kidney, that's going to become less compliant, and you're going to find that you can have uh, less ability to really regulate that, which means you're going to have a decline in GFR. Okay. 
which means we're not going to be able to uh, process drugs as effectively as to and other waste products. We're not going to be able to maintain acid base balance. Renal function is going to be one of the big things you're going to see, uh, and a lot of elderly patients are going to take a hit over time, right? So just looking at, at this slide, you can see here that, you know, looking at things like, you know, breathing capacity is going to go down, GFR is going to go down, cardiac index is going to go down. So we know these things are going to get worse. So again, that's why I, I talk about with um, looking at creatinine clearance. If I have like a 90-year-old patient who's got a, a, who's you know, got a creatinine of 0.6, I know that's not right. I know that is, is not really reflective of their actual renal function. I just know they have muscle wasting. I know they're not really producing as much muscles as, as they should. These are things um, that you have to take into account when evaluating your elderly patients, right? So looking at those normal changes from a GI standpoint, this is um, where you're going to probably see the, the fewest amount of changes overall. However, this is where you're going to find that a lot of patients have a lot of drug-drug interactions, drug-food interactions uh, that can be an issue here, right? Um, so for instance, you may have things like, you know, delayed gastric emptying. You may have, um, you know, say decreased hydrochloric acid um, uh, secretion and things like that. You may find decreased absorption. Overall, absorption does not change greatly for drugs. However, you know, if they're taking, um, you know, things like grapefruit juice or if they are taking things like milk along with their medications, you can find that that can impair absorption or, or maybe increase absorption as the case may be. But um, you're also going to find that a lot of patients are developing things like constipation chronically. That may be due to um, just normal disease states or it could be related back to the medications that you're taking. Oftentimes it's multifactorial, so that can be a problem. Um, and the other big thing is you're going to typically find with the liver, you're going to decrease blood flow, right? And again, less blood flow making it to the liver, guess what? Less drugs getting metabolized, right? Because again, if the drug doesn't get ever get delivered there, the metabolism can't occur, okay? So no major changes here, but again, look at things like dietary changes. Look at things if, um, you know, uh, you know, calcium in front of their milk is binding up their medications or iron, because again, a lot of these patients develop anemia. They need to be on iron. However, that can also bind up medications potentially. Um, look at things like uh, over-the-counter medications like laxatives or antacids. You know, antacids do what to the stomach pH? should increase, right, because they're neutralized. Think about your tums and things like that. Well, if I have a medication that needs that acidic environment to be absorbed and I try to increase the pH of the stomach because they're having GERD symptoms, guess what? That can make it less uh, well absorbed in those cases. Um, you may have cases where you have impaired gastric emptying, potentially, right? So uh, like diabetic patients will develop what we call gastroparesis, where they have delayed gastric emptying. Um, they have vomiting associated with that. You know, so if you ever have like people vomiting, it looks like food hasn't been digested at all. That could be a sign of gastroparesis. It could be an issue. Um, one of the big things that we're going to see that ch does change is absorption, no, no huge changes there, but with distribution, this is a big one, right? So typically with elderly patients, you're going to find they have reduced lean body mass, right? So typically less muscle mass compared to uh, younger patients, and they'll have reduced body water, okay? So comparing, say, a 20 to 30-year-old patient versus an older patient, you can see here things like lean body mass going to be less, right? Um, looking at their body fat percentage, what do you notice? typically goes up, right? So they're going to have more adipose tissue, less muscle mass, less less water overall. Looking at things like serum albumin, typically lower as well because they're not able to produce those proteins. You know, things like, you know, kidney blood flow um, or kidney weight and hepatic blood flow are going to go down as well. So what do you think this does to distribution, say, of lipophilic meds? Decrease or increase? Increase. Should increase, right? Because they have more adipose tissue, right? Good. Uh, hydrophilic medications. Should decrease, right? Because they have less body water, right? So again, you may find it's going to be uh, kind of kept more centrally. Um, so these are changes you have to take into account when you're, say, like monitoring levels or deciding what drug uh, dose you're going to administer a patient or how frequently you're going to give it, right? So um, other things like you know protein binding, if they have decreased levels of albumin, what do you think that does to drugs that have a high amount of protein binding? Can increase that volume of distribution, right? Because if they're not being held up in those serum proteins, they're going to distribute out to the tissues potentially. Not only that, but uh, remember we were talking about uh, free drug versus bound drug. Which one is pharmacologically active? Unbound. Unbound, the free drug, right? So again, if you have less albumin to bind that drug up, that percentage of free drug goes up. That means you may have, even though a normal level of total drug, you may find that free level is going to be too high and it may actually lead to some toxicity for your patients, right? So those are other things to look at. Um, but no, uh, it doesn't necessarily have decreases in proteins all across the board. Maybe you have some increases in proteins like alpha-1 acid like a protein. Um, that is uh, important for certain drugs. But again, um, you know, knowing specifically those changes are not so important. Just know that these changes are going to occur. And when you're looking at things like drug dosing, that, that's what we're taking into account, right? When you're looking at dosing for elderly patients, those are things we're looking at, right? Um, drug clearance is going to be another huge one. I cannot stress how much you need to look at this for your patients, especially over time. Um, and if you're working in the ER and you have a patient coming in, look at their baseline if you have it available. That's one of the biggest things we, we should be doing, especially uh, with EKGs, any labs you have, any kind of imaging. See what their baseline is if you have access to it. And then how their changes have occurred. So for instance, like, you know, you may think, well, 
you know, a lot of patients uh, coming in, or I guess, you know, if you think about like hospital systems and things like that, like Florida Hospital, there's hospitals all over, right? So again, chances are if your patient comes to one Florida hospital location, all that information is going to be centralized. That's one of the nice things about the kind of the digital age that we live in now is you have access to a lot of more information than you did before um, versus, you know, if they are, say, traveling from out of town, uh, you may not have any information whatsoever. So that's one of the problems we run into um, with patients at Nemours is that frequently a lot of our chronic kids, like they all see Nemours providers. We have all the information available to us. We can look at things like changes in renal function, hepatic function, all that over time. However, we get a lot of traveling patients, you know, make a wish kids are coming to, to Disney and they get sick and they come to us. We have no information whatsoever. So we're kind of working blind in those cases. Now we can call providers and get that information, but it's, uh, it's more difficult and it's a little bit more time intensive. But so please look for changes, look for that delta to see what's going on. Anyway, um, we know we're going to have decreased kidney function over time. Um, not only that, but that serum creatinine may not be reflective, right? So again, where does creatinine come from? The muscle. So they have less muscle, they produce less creatinine. So I mentioned you have a 90-year-old patient who does not have a whole lot of muscle mass, who has a creatinine of 0.6, I know their kidney function is not that good. I just know they don't make a whole lot of creatinine to begin with. And so in some cases, what I'll do if I'm dealing with elderly patients, I'll just go ahead and round that up to one. I'll just say, okay, well, I know I'm falsely overestimating what their renal function is. Let me just at least under, or overestimate a little less, you know, so again, I kind of bump it up to one. Um, it just depends on the patient. But what that does mean is we're going to have prolonged half-life of drugs. Drugs are going to be sticking around for longer for those that are renally eliminated. Um, you're going to find increased risk for high concentrations, right? So those levels can get super therapeutic. And this is also definitely affected by the hydration status, right? So I can't tell you how frequently I'll have these patients come in from uh, the nursing home. They uh, maybe got sick, some minor, it could be a relatively minor illness, you know, cold or something like that, and they will um, become dehydrated. And really no one's looking at them for a couple of days or so. Uh, they become very dehydrated. That causes an acute decrease in kidney function. And now these levels are sky high, right? So I've seen theophylline cases where um, patients be on theophylline forever. They've been on it for a long time with no issues. All of a sudden they get dehydrated, levels skyrocket, and all of a sudden they're, they're seething, right? So again, you gotta look at things like hydration status. Again, uh, going back to looking at the cockcroft gold equation, remember, you know, if serum creatinine is falsely low, like in a patient with less muscle mass, you know, it's going to make your creatinine clearance look falsely high. Okay, so again, you guys are familiar with that. Um, this is why we also have different uh, equations. You know, MDRD equation might be better in some elderly patients. Um, it just really depends. And you'll get a feel for it whenever you go to work somewhere. They'll have their kind of their set standard for this is the equation we use for these type of patients. We'll use this equation for elderly or kids or whatever, right? So you can just, you'll be familiar with that. Okay. Um, some other things, you know, looking at drug clearance in the liver, we would typically expect this to be lower than general. Uh, most of it has to do with the, the blood flow being delivered to the liver in the first place, right? Um, now, as far as things like, you know, first pass metabolism, um, you may find some decreased function, uh, decreased function in, in phase one metabolism here, but for the most part, uh, the decreased metabolism is related to the blood flow, okay? Uh, more often than not, though, what you're going to run into is those drug interactions, right? Because as you're on more drugs, you're going to more likely to find either SIP inducers or SIP inhibitors. So, for instance, if I have a SIP inducer on board, what does that do to the levels of, of drugs that are affected? It should decrease them, right? If I have a SIP inhibitor... It increase the levels, right? Because again, those enzymes are not working as well. So again, these are things to, to look at. Okay, so um, those are the, the main pharmacokinetic changes you'll see with those elderly patients. But what about the pharmacodynamic changes, right? So again, the, the effects of the drug having on the body specifically, you know, some people feel like geriatric uh, patients are just more sensitive. In some cases, that may be true. Uh, oftentimes, it has to do with the kinetics, though, right? So again, I give a 100 milligram drug to a patient who is a healthy adult. They have no problems with it. If I give that same dose to an elderly patient, maybe the same weight, um, but you're going to find they may be much more likely to develop toxicity. Some of that's related to the kinetics, if they're not able to clear the drug well or if it's distributing differently. Um, but in some cases, you may find they have sort of impaired uh, homeostatic responses, right? So the ability to maintain homeostasis with things like cardiac output. You know, if they're going from sitting to standing and they're on an uh, antihypertensive medication, that may blunt their ability to really get the heart rate up, to get cardiac output up, and now they're getting... Uh, uh, may uh, develop you know, dizziness, it may have uh, uh, syncope potentially. These are all things you have to look at, right? You have things like, um, I mentioned postural hypertension goes along with that. Um, temperature regulation, you know, do elderly patients tend to, um, they tend to be cold frequently or hot frequently? Cold, right? Because they can't really regulate their temperatures very well. And that's how I knew my parents were getting older because I go to their house now and they have the temperature set to like 78 and I'm just like sweating. I'm like, what is wrong with you people? Like, we get so cold all the time, but I'm just like, oh, you guys are getting old. It's no good. Um, the other thing is like fasting blood glucose, right? These patients typically will tend to get more insulin resistant as time goes on. Blood glucose is going to go up as a result. So 
Looking at adverse drug reactions, we know if we increase the number of meds they're going to be on, we know we're going to increase the number of adverse drug reactions they're going to experience, right? With a single medication, let's say you get maybe a 10% chance of having uh, an adverse reaction. By the time you get to 10 medications, it could be nearly 100%, right? So again, they're probably going to have some issue. And again, unless you educate them on what to look for, they may not even know it's a side effect. They may just think, I'm just getting older. I'm just getting constipated all the time. That's just life now, right? It may not be the case. It could be the fact we put you on a medication to make you constipated, okay? Um, and that, and make sure they really educate them on over-the-counter herbal medications. Uh, I don't care what your feelings are on herbal medications, but your patient is going to have their own thoughts. And again, if they're really pro herbals and they kind of get the feeling from you, you're like, well, that stuff just doesn't work. This stuff's crap. They're not going to want to tell you about it. Right. So again, you need to have those open conversations and make it, you know, say, Hey, if this is something you want to try, okay, that's fine. But let's take into account all your other medications you're on. Let's take into account the whole picture here. Right. You don't want to come across as judgmental because then they're just not going to tell you stuff. That's no good. And again, you can have those cases where someone's taking ginkgo for their memory and all of a sudden now they uh, don't have any memory because they stroked out and, and they're dead now. Right. Anywho, um, other things to look at, prescriber errors is a big problem here, right? So for instance, if you're not taking into those age-related changes, so looking at renal function, hepatic function, um, you know, patient compliance errors can be an issue here. So either due to like cognitive decline, where they're either taking too much medication or not enough medication. Um, I've had patients, I can't tell you how often at the poison center uh, that, um, you know, say I can't tell you how often and then I just tell you how often that actually occurs. But anyway, um, <laughs> I just realized that was kind of oxymoronic, but or just moronic, but um, so at the poison centers, we have there's a medication for COPD called Spareva, okay? And basically, it's this inhaler. You put a little tiny capsule into, you uh, press the button, it'll puncture the capsule, and then this powder can then be inhaled, right? Why? Well, what do you think patients do with that, especially the elderly? It's a capsule, I think. I'm just going to take it orally, right? So because it gets mixed up with all their other medications they're taking, other their pill reminders and things like that. So I, I've had the hundreds of calls to the poison center that say, "Oh, I accidentally swallowed my spirevum. Am I going to be okay?" And again, that's a compliance error, right? So again, if they they keep doing that continually, guess what? And then they might not have enough to actually take their medication uh, as they should. So those are errors we run into uh, frequently. Now the other big thing is seeing multiple providers. Do all your patients see just one provider to see you? No, they're going to see their specialists. They're going to see their endocrinologists. They're going to see their uh, ophthalmologists. They're going to be seeing their their rheumatologists and, and and you, right? So you get all these different providers, and you might be the central person there that's providing kind of like the majority of their kind of general care. Um, you know, and how likely is it that the cardiologist wants to mess with the endocrinologist meds? Never, ever, 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 right? Because they can get in trouble, right? Because they said, why the heck did you do that? And you as a, as a center there, if you want to change anything, guess what? You might get in trouble with all, all, all the providers, right? Um, this is uh, a big problem. And again, this is why it's good to have interdisciplinary care. It's good to make sure you consult with all these uh, other providers to see like, okay, well, listen, you know, there are, the cardiologist wrote for this medication, but it's causing this side effect. I think we can maybe change it to this and that'll fix the problem. So we'll maintain their treatment for whatever condition, but we can get around this other side effect, right? You have to have those conversations because this is how we have patients who are on a dozen different medications. No one's talking to each other. You know, left hand's not talking to the right hand. And that's how you can run into lots of big issues. Issues, either due to um, you know metabolism interactions like sip inhibition, um, you know just uh, antagonistic effects. So imagine I'm putting a patient on a medication for um, you know their their diabetes that you know will lower their blood sugar, but then someone else puts them on a medication that raises their blood sugar. It's antagonistic, and you have to kind of address those sort of things. Otherwise, they're just going to be on it forever. And they say, well, I can't get your sugars under control. What's going on here? Not realizing they're on a medication that's been raising up this whole time. Okay. Um, other things, you know, patients may not recognize that drugs are actually drugs, right? So has anyone ever heard of a BC powder or a goodies powder? Yeah. It's kind of a Southern uh, sort of thing I've kind of found. Uh, a lot of people like from up North, they've never heard of it before. W what drug is it? Yeah, it's a couple of things, but uh, predominantly it's aspirin. It's powdered aspirin. It comes in these nice little uh, wax papers you can just dump into your drink. You have a headache or something like that. Um, they may not understand that that is actually aspirin. So, for instance, um, you know, I have patients that will take these uh, every time they get a headache, um, you know, and not realize that, hey, uh, that is aspirin. So, if you take additional aspirin in, in conjunction with that, guess what? Now you have two high levels. I had uh, one patient who would take uh, a BC powder every time he had chest pain. They just say, okay, if you have chest pain, go ahead and just take it. That was Somehow that was the message he got. So, he was having chest pain throughout the day, and he's taking these BC powders several, several times throughout the day. Finally, he said, well, I should probably call 911. This chest pain is not going away. So EMS arrives and says, hey, have you taken any aspirin today? He's like, nope, haven't taken any aspirin. Guess what they do? They give him aspirin. Okay, okay. And then he gets into the ER, and the resident's like, hey, have you had any aspirin today? He's like, nope, I haven't had any aspirin today. Guess what the resident does? Give him some more aspirin, right, because he didn't read the, the run sheet from EMS. Uh, so then at that point, the patient's like, oh, I've got this like ring in my ears, and I'm kind of sweating. And they're like, oh, we should probably check an aspirin level. What do you know? It's high, right? So now, now the patient's in for possible, you know, cardiac rule out in addition to the aspirin overdose he's inadvertently received, right? So these are things you have to kind of ask about. Some of these things may be regional, just depends, right? 
Um, okay, so some other uh, concepts to consider. You know, there's a lot of obstacles to compliance, so medication expense being one of the biggest ones, right? Um, you may think, man, this this new arthritis medication that you know the the drug company sent me out to this nice dinner for, and they got me these nice golf clubs. Like, this is the best drug in the world, right? Um, but if it costs you know hundreds of dollars, it may not be as as good as the thing that they can actually afford because if they can't afford it, they're not going to get it, right? Aspirin's five bucks a bottle, right? Uh, ibuprofen, ten to twenty bucks. Um, some medication you can get for very very cheap next to free in a lot of cases, right? So again, look at things like your Publix cheap drug list or free drug list. Look at your Walmart $4 list because this is going to be the bread and butter of what you're going to prescribe from the general care sort of standpoint because that's what patients can afford, right? Um, you know, um, Anything what was I going to say? Lost my train of thought. But anyway, um, be careful with medications that have kind of mixed dosing intervals. So again, if I have a drug that is given three times a day and one that's given twice a day, like how are they going to navigate that? So if you can try and limit it to they're taking, okay, you're taking these two pills twice a day, that can be much more um, likely to be compliant. Um, things like intelligent non-compliance. What do you think this is? Yeah, they're choosing to not follow your regimen for one reason or another, right? So again, if they're saying, I'm going to skip doses because I can afford that, or if they're saying, hey, I'm getting a side effect and, and it doesn't happen if I only take it one day, one time a day versus twice a day, but they tell you, oh yeah, of course I'm taking it twice a day. These are things you want to have like good, frank and open conversations with them about. So that way, um, you know, that communication is good and you can kind of uh, tease out some of these issues here. Um, and the other thing, can the patient actually physically take the drug, right? I can't tell you how many patients, um, I will now begin to tell you how many patients. Um, <laughs> If they can't inject things themselves because their their uh, dexterity of their hands has gone down due to things like rheumatoid or osteoarthritis. Um, if they are not able to coordinate inhaling from an inhaler uh, due to the fact they have, you know, again, poor hand-eye coordination or, or poor uh, hand dexterity, those are things that can be a big issue. Um, if they have dysarthria or dysphagia and they cannot swallow appropriately, like, you, know, you have to look into all these different factors to make sure they can actually get the med uh, into their system as appropriate, right? Okay. So for geriatrics, so again, this is more one of those things where um, when we're talking about you know, hypertension, we're talking about diabetes, geriatrics kind of gets roped into that very frequently, right? So again, that's why that was kind of a brief overview. We're going to hit these topics over and over again when we actually get into the meat and potatoes of Farm 1 and Farm 2 as we go forward. Pediatrics is a little bit different because, again, this is a very specialized subset of patients. Anyone interest, uh, with interest in working with pediatrics? Fantastic. I think it's a great, uh, I never thought I would be working in pediatrics ever. Um, I just needed a job when I got out of fellowship, so I was like, I'll work anywhere. Uh, any ER job you got, I'll work it. And then I uh, said, okay, pediatric hospitals. I have no idea what to do with peds, but let's go, let's go for it, right? Uh, now I love it. It's great. I love working with these little kids. Um, very frequently, I can fix their problem, or you know, we as a team can fix their problems. That one is not. It wasn't because they've been smoking for 30 years or it's not because, you know, they've been eating juicy hamburgers for, for 50 years. It's usually because it wasn't like their fault in the first place to get sick. And then they have the incredible ability to recover from near life death uh, sort of life and death sort of situations. It's really incredible to get someone who, you know, happened to an adult patient, no chance for recovery whatsoever. A little kid, they can bounce back from, from a lot of things. Uh, really rewarding. But let's look at some of the, the issues we deal with in regards to, to pediatric pharmacology. I probably won't be able to finish this today, but we'll, we'll hit it next time. So anyway, why are peds so different? You know, can we just treat them like little adults? Absolutely not. You have to treat them as their own specific subset of patients. They're a very heterogeneous population. What does that mean? They're very, very different from one another, right? So if I'm going from, say, for instance, right now, my kids are two years old and six months old. Physiologically, they are could be not further uh, in difference than a two-year-old and say a 70-year-old, right? Um, because there's so much development that goes on in the very early periods of life that you have to take all these things into account, right? Um, constantly physiologically changing uh, from, from month to month and day to day in some cases, right? Um, the other big thing we run into is, is a problem is the fact that we have very limited data um, and, and very limited studies in pediatric populations. Is it ethical to take a bunch of kids and give half of them this drug and half of them this. It's very difficult to do studies in these little kids. Um, and so very frequently we're taking adult data and trying to extrapolate it back to kids. And what did I just say? They're not little adults, right? You know, so you can't necessarily take that as a one-to-one -one sort of um, uh, extrapolation. And so you run into issues, right? So again, limited data is, is a big problem. You run into that with certain types of, uh, of um, you know, different uh, specialties like a toxicology. I can't really overdose a bunch of people or, you know, give them snake bites and then treat them this way and treat this group this way. Yeah, so there's a lot of issues with, with ethics and, and things like that, but uh, PEDS is another kind of condition. Anyway, so some of the lingo here, when we're talking about gestational age, we're basically talking about the maturity at birth. And so this is based on the last menstrual period, if you know when it is, uh, and also based on physical exams. You're doing the ultrasound of the baby, you try to correlate you know, when the last menstrual period was versus um, the actual size of the baby, and you can make some correlations there to the actual the gestational age. Um, postnatal age just refers to the chronological 
chronological age after birth, and then post-conceptional is both uh, gestational and postnatal. Very frequently, we're either going to be using gestational age um, and using it in conjunction with postnatal. You don't hear a lot of people talk about post-conceptional, at least in, in my experience, but those other two we, we use uh, quite frequently. So preterm is considered anyone who's going to be less than 30, 37 weeks of gestational age. Full term is usually 37 to 42, and then post term would be anything greater than 43. Usually by then the, the mom is like, just get this thing out of me. I just want it gone. Please don't let me get to 43 weeks. But um, and then we're talking about uh, newborns or neonates. You may hear me use some of the, the terms interchangeably. When I'm talking about infants, I may refer to anyone within their first year of age. Um, however, a newborn or a neonate is a very specifically that first 28 days of life. Okay, So if I talk about a neonate, that means someone who's going to be in that first 28 days, that first month of life there. Okay, Infant, again, can be really anyone within their first year. Um, but again, we're talking about uh, neonates, newborns, first month. Toddler is usually that, uh, say, one to two year age range, young child two to five, older kids six to 12, and then adolescents 13 to 17, roughly, right? So, um, and again, physiologically, they tend to get more and more similar to adults as you go on. So by the time I get to an adolescent, if I have a kid who is, you know, if I, and we, we have a deal with uh, Disney where, you know, if kids get sick of Disney, they come over to us. And so we have like the wide world of sports or whatever there, and there's a lot of tournaments and things like that. So if I get a 100 kilogram, 16 year old linebacker that gets injured and comes over to us, am I gonna treat him like a normal 16 year old, I'm gonna treat them like an adult. Very frequently, they're physiologically close enough to an adult, I can just go ahead and use that, right? And that's gonna be a good caveat here. When you're dosing things for pediatrics, if you get up to the adult dose, do you wanna go beyond that? No, you cap it out at the adult doses, right? So again, if a normal dose for ibuprofen, let's say for instance, you know, I have a 100 kilogram uh, kid that I'm treating, right? Um, and the dose for ibuprofen is 10 milligrams per kilogram, okay? So for that kid, you would think 1,000 milligrams would be the dose. Well, the typical adult max for ibuprofen is 800 milligrams. I'm not going to go beyond 800. I'm just going to go and cap it out of that, right? So that's one example. Um, but that's a good rule of thumb for, for pediatric uh, dosing, okay? So, anywho, so let's look at some of the changes that occur here. And, and the biggest changes are occurring within really that first month of life or so. And so we're going to kind of focus on the first couple months of life, really within the infancy sort of stage, um, as we're talking about differences in kinetics and uh, any kind of pharmacodynamic changes that occur here as well, okay? So first off, let's talk about absorption. Um, going back and remembering what is uh, what are some of the things that actually affect how well a drug gets absorbed via different membranes, right? So again, looking at things like molecular weight, you think bigger molecules or smaller molecules get absorbed better? Smaller, smaller makes sense, right? Um, looking at things like particle size, smaller is better in these cases. Uh, remember we're talking about pH and pKa? Or like dissolves like. So again, looking at things like changes in pH are going to be a big deal, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then also dosage form. So again, um, with little kids, like how what kind of dosage forms are preferred? Yeah, liquid medicine. So we frequently have to use liquid medications because they cannot take tablets. However, I mean, I'll have full adult patients who have uh, no medical issues and they still refuse to take tablets. So again, it just depends. But typically, liquid medications are going to be a big one. We'll look at some other dosage forms as well. And then also looking at the anatomical physiologic characteristics uh, of the site of absorption, right? So if I'm trying to use an intramuscular injection versus subcutaneous versus IV, how are those going to be changing, especially knowing what we know about adult patients? How is that going to be different for, say, the infant? So first off, we're talking about gastric absorption. Two of the major things that are going to affect um, gastric absorption of medications is going to be gastric acidity and also the gastrointestinal emptying time, right? So again, how quickly things are going to be moving throughout the, the GI tract and then the, the acidity of the, the actual stomach itself. Um, this is going to differ pretty greatly between uh, infants and adults, as we're going to see here. So looking at um, pH, what you're going to find is, is that typically when the kid is first born, what do you think the stomach pH is? Say normally in an adult, it's like two. What do you think it's going to be for a, little, uh, a neonate? Higher or lower than that? Probably higher, right? Do you think they're producing a lot of acid right off the bat? No. no. Also, what has their GI tract probably been full of this whole nine months? Amniotic fluid, right? Typically, it's going to be a little bit more on the neutral side of things, right? So again, typically, pH is going to be pretty um, neutral in the stomach, which may cause decreased absorption, especially of acidic or more basic medications. More acidic medications, right? So again, acidic drugs are going to be more in that ionized state. They're going to have a harder time being absorbed, as we know from hopefully your test you took today, right? Um, typically, what you find, the more preterm an infant is, again, um, when you have a kid who's born at, say, 34, um, uh, 34 weeks for day versus 24 weeks, a 24-week-old kid, like, he should have been cooking for a couple extra months there, right? And so, again, when their organs come out, it's not like they magically just turn into term uh, sort of organs. They still need that time to develop. And so you, you will typically see, even at, say, six months out, they're still kind of underperforming compared to kids who are born at full term, okay? So that's one of those things to keep in mind is that you can have a 24-weeker, which is usually the youngest you're going to find, the earliest gestational age. Beyond that, or earlier than that, 
typically not really physiologically viable at that point. Um, but we'll have some 24 weekers. We'll keep them in the NICU for months and months and months, uh, potentially years as the case may be. But um, typically, the more preterm they are, the higher the pH is going to be, and it's going to take them time to get that uh, that uh, actual stomach acid to be produced, which means those drugs may not be absorbed as well. And again, looking at a full-term infant, um, you know, pH is around six to eight for the first three days or so, right? And so as they kind of wash out that amniotic fluid and as their parietal cells start to produce that HCL, that's when you're going to see the pH start to drop again, okay? Um, you'll see probably the highest acid content between, say, one to 10 days or so. And then usually um, by around three months or so, they should be getting close to an adult sort of value, okay? So again, it can change over time between the different months, but by the time they're three months, they should be close to an adult. So as I mentioned, for acidic meds, you're going to find more ionization, which means decreased absorption. Basic meds may have an easier time being absorbed. Um, the other thing, the gastrointestinal em emptying time or the uh, gastrointestinal like, you know, transit time, you hear some, some different terms there. Um, basically, this is going to determine the rate of absorption. So um, I don't know if anyone has dealt with uh, uh, an infant before, especially during the first six months of life. But what are their bowel habits usually like? Frequent, infrequent? Very frequent. You're going to have like five to six poops a day, right? A lot of dirty diapers are going to be changing for these kids. However, after six months or so, you're going to start to notice that it's going to start to change. It's going to start to slow down as their uh, stools get uh, better formed, uh, as their you know, little gut floor is starting to change, things like that. I'm actually going through that right now. So I'm going from uh, my, my infant who was having, you know, again, five to six poopy diapers a day. Now it's, uh, I think we're going on day three of Poop Watch 2018 and she is grunting, not sleeping because her little gut's changing and she's trying to get used to that and it's it's not going well, right? So again, and by the time she does have a bowel movement, it's no good, right? It's, it's a bad scene. I really hope my daughters never go back and watch these ever again because they're going to be mortified. But uh, it's good to at least illustrate to you guys uh, some of the things you see. So anyway, what you end up seeing is that the GIT is typically shorter during these first few months of life, which means drugs have more or less contact time with the GI tract. Less, because it's going through so quickly. So what you end up finding is they have uh, worse absorption potentially. Uh, not only that, what's another route that we will frequently give infants, right? Rectal administration, right? So again, if they had that kind of increased rectal um, uh, uh, contractions, you can potentially find that, you know, if you put a suppository in there before it's really had time to melt and absorb, they'll just spit it right back out. Well, not really spit it, but they'll poop it right back out at you. Uh, and so you're gonna find that can limit the absorption you can have some of these medications, right? Other things that can uh, be a problem, you know, congenital heart disease. Some of these things may not be diagnosed until, you know, say months after birth, but they have decreased blood flow to the GI tract because sometimes if the body's having a hard time perfusing critical organs, the GI tract will take a back seat. That can also slow down the actual time as well. Uh, it may not lead to, it may lead to, you know, differences in absorption. Uh, feeding is going to be uh, important here. So whether they're breastfed versus on formula, that can have an effect. And then gestational versus postnatal age. Typically, the more immature they are, the kind of uh, the more underdeveloped the GI tract is, that can have an effect as well. Okay, so just know there's going to be some variability here uh, amongst infants, and depending on how premature they are, it can be even more variable. So again, as I mentioned, uh, shorter transit times means less contact with absorptive surfaces, surfaces, so you should see less absorption occurring there. This means if you, say, use an extended release preparation that was meant to absorb over 24 hours, if it gets spit out early, you're not going to absorb that medication, right? And this could account for differences in concentration between uh, various infants. So if I had, say, a 30-week gestational age infant versus, say, a, um, a 38, you may find differences in concentration for those babies, even, even though I gave the same dose of drug, um, due to this variability here. Other things you can find. So let's look at extra oral drug absorptions. We're looking at things like muscular blood flow. We'll look at mucosal permeability and then also skin permeability as well. And you can kind of refer back to this. Uh, we'll go into the details here in just a moment. So um, looking at intramuscular absorption. So this can be dependent on several factors. And so typically what you're going to find is that the less blood flow you have going to the muscle, what do you think that does to absorption? It'll slow it down. The, again, the drug is still there in the muscle, so it's not going to go anywhere. So it'll probably the total amount of absorption will be similar, but it'll be slower, right? So it may be a lot slower to actually get that, that drug absorbed. Um, again, it could also be depend on things like right through the capillaries and then uh, also the, the apparent volume to which the drug has been distributed to. So one of the things I'll, I'll kind of note here as far as distribution for uh, infants go, goes is they're basically just big bags of water, right? So again, uh, if you think about their total body water compared to an adult patient, they're much, much higher percentage of body water. This is going to affect how hydrophilic medications pretty drastically, and I'll show you some dosing comparisons just a little bit to kind of illustrate that, right? Um, other things you're going to find, neonates and infants typically are going to have less blood flow to the muscles. They may not be moving around as much to kind of get that blood flow pumping. 
Um, there again, they're going to have an increased percent of water in the muscles, which can apparent, uh, increase the volume of distribution for especially hydrophilic medications. And then uh, due to the decreased amount of muscular contractions, they're not moving around a whole lot. Um, that can also decrease that penetration, right? Less blood flow going to the muscles means less absorption happening there. And one of the other problems you run into is this kind of peripheral vasomotor instability. So again, they can't really control um, how well their, their blood vessels are going to be dilating or constricting uh, from a temperature regulation standpoint. Because very frequently, if a premature baby, what do you have to put them under? A heat lamp, right? You have to kind of keep them warm uh, because they can't regulate that themselves. So again, you have to make sure you're wrapping them up, put them in little hats on their heads so that way they don't lose heat. Um, so because of that, it may also deal with a um, uh, decreased amount of blood flow actually getting into the muscles and absorb that drug effectively. So other things, uh, rectal absorption. So um, you're going to find that due to kind of the thin membranes that they have compared to an adult, they have pretty good bioavailability of uh, many medications via the rectal route. Um, however, you do have to make sure that they keep the medication in the rectum, otherwise it won't be absorbed, right? So very frequently we're doing Tylenol suppositories. Um, we're doing, has anyone ever tried to give like a little kid uh, oral medication? It's more difficult than you might think. You know, they're probably going to spit it right back out at you. Yeah, there's a blow right back out at you and then it's all over your face, right? Um, trying to give my two-year-old any medication it is a uh, Herculean feat. Um, I have so much more respect for uh, peds nurses uh, than I ever had before um, since I had kids. But, um, but again, make sure to watch those rectal uh, contractions because they can spit out the medication too quickly and then they don't absorb the drug, right? Um, other route. So again, if you needed to get IV access on a kid, how easy do you think it is to get an IV on a little kid? Very difficult. Imagine being like uh, being a paramedic in the back of an ambulance, bouncing around trying to get an uh, IV on a kid. Near impossible, right? Very, very difficult. Um, so because of that, because their veins are more delicate, they are more likely to um, you know have uh, you know extravasation through the veins, you know things like that. Remember we talked about extravasation. What does that mean? Yeah, drugs going outside of the vein, essentially, right? Because of that that risk, um, you need a good, easy way to get access on, on a child, right? So especially if they're coding, you need to give them medications. This is where the intraosseous um, route can actually be very useful here. So here's an example of kind of a manual. Um, and basically, it's like drilling down into the bone, essentially, because that, that marrow is a nice, basically non-collapsible vein. So if you need a IV access very quickly, you can still do this on adult patients, but I see this more in, in kids. Um, and again, this is very good and useful uh, for emergent situations. If I need to get fluid, medications, anything like that, put it right into the bone and get some absorb very easily uh, throughout the rest of the systemic circulation, which is good. Um, when I had one uh, patient who came in, uh, is, a, is an adult patient who was coding and they couldn't get um, IV access, so they did an IO uh, on this patient. And um, unfortunately, patient died. And so they're trying to get him prepped up for the patient to actually see him, but they were trying to take the, the IO out. And you guys ever seen the easy IO? It basically looks like giant thumbtacks uh, that you're putting into the patients. They have a nice big plastic hub, essentially. Um, and so they were trying to pull it out, and then all of a sudden the, the, the plastic bit came off. And so they had this big needle just sticking out of the patient's leg, and they're like, um, okay. So we had to get pliers to actually get it out. It was, it was a big mess. But um, anyway. Other things to note for, for uh, kids and, and drug absorption, uh, percutaneous or transdermal sort of drug absorption is much easier in kids than you will see with adults. And this can actually lead to toxicities in some cases, which I'll note uh, in just a moment. But um, their stratum corneum is much less developed than you see with an adult patient. You know, adults have nice thick skin, kids do not. And so because of that, they can have a pretty good absorption of, of various things. So for instance, um, we used to use betadine as an antiseptic on their skin to clean them off. Not great because of the iodine in there, they were able to absorb a much greater uh, to a much greater extent than adults could and cause hypothyroidism, right? Normally, you think iodine is necessary for producing thyroid hormone, but actually, if you have too much, that can have a, an inhibitory effect on the thyroid. So, that can actually cause hypothyroidism. Um, other things you can see, you know, we used to use isopropyl baths or isopropyl alcohol baths uh, for these little kids. And actually found they would absorb the isopropyl alcohol and develop hypoglycemia because of that, right? You know, these little drunk infants, that's, that's no good, right? Um, so again, just note that also their skin's very well hydrated, so they absorb things very, very easily. And also just their body surface area is much greater than an adult based on the, their, their uh, weight. So what do we use to clean the um, it depends. We can use things like um, like chlorhexidine might be an okay thing to use. Um, i trying to think what else they use. There's other antiseptics that they use. Um, it just depends. And usually it's uh, more like a nursing care sort of thing. We actually don't end up dealing with a lot of that uh, from the pharmacy standpoint. But yeah, they have other things they use that are, and you'll find that like whether you're working in the NICU versus say, like a general pediatric floor, they'll have different um, uh, products available uh, to work with because we know that those changes occur. Did I talk about the, the kids that were testing positive for marijuana? I mentioned that before. So there is a good example of this. So there, I think there was a hospital out in California where these um, these babies were being born, and one of the screenings they would do, I guess, on certain high risk patients, is they would do a urine drug screen on the kid. Because again, if mom is being exposed to drugs during pregnancy, the kid should also be exposed, and then they would be positive. So they had these little these babies that were positive for THC. 
And they were like, mom's like, I didn't smoke any marijuana the entire pregnancy. This is impossible. How in the heck is this kid positive for THC? And so they went back and they checked the mom, did urine drug screen on her, and guess what? She was negative. It's like, well, what's going on here? So they started to go back, like, what could these babies be exposed to? It's not like they're lighting up in the in the nursery, you know, anything like that. <laughs> so they had to figure out what in the heck was going on. So what they actually found was there was a certain um, lotion that they were using on the baby's skin that actually one of the components, I think it was like an Aveeno product, one of the components of that actually tripped the assay for THC. It didn't con contain THC, but it was close enough structurally that it looked like it to the machine. And so when they found that those babies were the ones that were using that, and then they you know, took the stuff away, all of a sudden they were negative, or they were, they were negative at that point. So again, it was going to show you that they were able to absorb that, that product uh, well enough because they had that underdeveloped skin, right? Anyway. So just something to know. Um, so be careful. You know, we have things like anticholinergic um, drugs that you can use on the skin that can lead to seizures. So if you have like a Benadryl lotion or something, that can lead to seizures. I mentioned the hypoglycemia. So you have to be really, really careful with skin absorption uh, for things in, in these infants. Okay. Uh, so just go over... That was real briefly. Let's talk about volume distribution. Um, so again, things that affect volume distribution, the lipid versus um, a water solubility is going to be playing a big role here. We'll look at things like plasma protein binding, tissue binding, and then also kind of peripheral tissue distribution, as we'll see uh, kind of as a total here. Um, just remember that many disease states can affect volume distribution. So again, looking at things like edema, burn victims, all that can be playing a big role here. So let's see how it actually applies to as I mentioned, they're big bags of water. Roughly 70 to 75% of their body weight should be water. And they have a lot higher extracellular component of water than an adult would. So I say 40 versus 20% there. They also have less fat tissue, right? Even though they might not have all these nice chunky babies and nice big rolls, they actually have uh, a lot of that's water, not necessarily all adipose tissue. And they also have less muscle mass. So this means you're going to have a lot larger volume of distribution for hydrophilic meds than you do, say, for uh, either, you know, an adult patient or adolescent even. Um, these infants, and especially that first year, a lot of, wa uh, a lot of water. Basically, what this means, and again, I wouldn't recommend putting your kids into buckets, um, or at least take them out afterwards. It's very funny, though, if you can get a good picture. Um, basically, what this means is that for a hydrophilic medication, their bucket's a lot bigger, right? They have a lot more water for the drug to distribute into, which means I have to give a bigger milligram per kilogram dose uh, for an infant than I do, say, for an adult patient, okay? Because, again, their bucket's just smaller. So I'll show you an example of that. So here's the drug called gentamicin. It's an amino glycoside that we use for gram-negative infections. It's very common we would use this for, say, like um, uh, neonatal sepsis, uh, neonatal meningitis, or something like that to, to, uh, to get rid of gram-negative bugs. And if you look at the volume of distribution, you notice here that it's, say, 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.6 liters per kilo for, uh, say, a neonate versus, say, 0. 0.2 to 0. 0.3 for an adult. What does that mean? That means that in order to get the same concentration, so again, going back to that C0 equals dose over VD, my VD has gone up significantly. What do I have to do to get the C0 back up? I have to increase the dose, right? And that makes sense because when you're looking at the, the dosing here between, a, say, a neonate to an adult patient, it's four to five milligrams per kilo per dose versus just one to two. This means for the neonate, I'm giving a much higher milligram per kilogram amount of drug to get the same concentration for an adult that I have to give one to two milligrams per kilo. Okay, so even though it may not make sense when you're looking, I was like, why would a baby need a, such a bigger dose? It all goes back to the kinetics of it, right? So again, when you're looking at those differences in, in dosing, that's what we're trying to take into account. So again, do I expect you to memorize all these facts when going through and looking at drug dosing? No, but when you see these differences in the drug references, you should be able to kind of put two and two together. Be like, oh, this makes sense based, based on these differences in kinetics. Yes, sir. Is this a water soluble drug? Yeah, so gentamicin is a very water soluble drug, and so yeah, and that, this will come up again a little bit later on. Uh, we're talking about kidney elimination as well. But yes, yeah, this is a very hydrophilic medication. Should have mentioned that, but thank you for clarifying. Uh, other things you're going to find, they're going to have decreased plasma proteins available. So this may mean things that are normally bound uh, significantly in the bloodstream may uh, partition out to the tissues. That can affect uh, uh, you know, the, the volume distribution. Uh, in some cases, you may even have certain other endogenous products that are competing for the same binding sites. There's one product called bilirubin, uh, which is uh, anyone know where bilirubin comes from? Uh, yeah, so eventually we'll store it in the gallbladder for elimination. Where does it actually come from? Yeah, so we're producing the liver, but it comes from the breakdown of? Hemoglobin, yes, yeah, so red blood cells and hemoglobin, right? So again, that's where we're going to get a lot of our bilirubin from. Um, anyway, so this is one of those things that typically in neonates, especially during that first month, they're going to have a lot of bilirubin, right? So they're going to have a lot of bilirubin that's trying to bind up to things like albumin. And so there's actually um, a drug called ceftriaxone or recephin. Anyone ever heard of recephin before? Very frequent um, uh, antibiotic we give for all kinds of different indications. However, we cannot use it during the first month of life because what will happen is that ceftriaxone will go for the same binding sites as bilirubin. In these infants, they have a lot of bilirubin being bound up um, by the albumin. And so the recephin comes in, it kicks off that bilirubin, 
Now it's all of a sudden they're floating around the bloodstream and the baby gets jaundice. So for that first month, we can't use that drug. We have to use an alternative instead based on these kinetic alterations here, right? So again, these are things you have to consider. Um, another one uh, would be an anti-epileptic anti drug called phenytoin. Um, because they would have less proteins to bind to this drug, more of it would be free. And we said that which is the pharmacologically active the free, yeah, the free drug, which means they could have a normal level, a total drug, but they could have too much free drug causing t toxicity. Okay, so these are things to think about. And again, just looking at something, I'm not going to expect you to memorize all these protein changes, but just know that between a neonate and infant and a child, there can be drastic differences here, right? So it could either be reduced, um, could be increased, could be present, not present. Uh, it will change over time, and that can affect the, the different drug considerations. Okay, so that's why when you uh, say, for instance, when you go to look up LexiComp. Uh, for your drug information or something, there's a peds lexi and a normal lexi, right? Or any other reference, there should be a peds section versus an adult section. There's a reason why that is because of these differences here, okay? So it's important to make sure if you're dealing with a two year old, you look at the peds stuff versus if you're dealing with, a, say, a 20 year old. Okay, so let's go ahead and cut it there. Do you have any questions before I let you go? We'll finish up uh, this section uh, next time in addition to section six. I think we'll have two more meetings after this and then you guys have the test. Mm -hmm. Sounds right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, so two more lectures. You'll have the final. I won't be here for that day, but um, you'll have a homework assignment, which is now posted. Homework assignment three is posted online. You should have that due uh, next week for class. And then we'll have homework assignment four due for the last lecture, which I'll post up next week. Uh, and then the test will be following that. Yes, that exam will be cumulative. It'll be 50 questions. It'll be like a typical exam. 50 questions, still five answer choices, but it'll go over the entire class, okay? So you may see some similar concepts in the first two tests that will show up on there for sure. Um, and then we'll have a lot of the new stuff on, on there additionally. Well, it's, all, it's only 50 questions, so I might, I will, I will attempt to make it pretty equal across the board. Um, but, you know, looking at things like, you know, looking at pediatrics, right? All the concepts from the pharmacokinetic lecture are applying here, right? So, you know, a lot of these things we're kind of carrying forward. Um, but things like definitions may pop up, you know, things like um, some of the calculations we, we looked at before may pop up. We'll look at some new calculations with peds here in a little bit. But, um, yeah, the, all that stuff is going to be fair game. Okay. Any other questions I can answer? Uh, I'm going to go review the test. I'll see if there's any givebacks. I'll put an announcement up um, regarding that. And, and if any high misses or anything, I'll, I'll clarify those concepts. Okay? All right, no problem. See you next time.